In 2019, it's time to stand up for the right to privacy, yours, mine, all of ours. Consumers shouldn't have to tolerate another year of companies irresponsibly amassing huge user profiles, data breaches that seem out of control, and the vanishing ability to control our own digital lives. This problem is solvable. It isn't too big, too challenging, or too late. Innovation, breakthrough ideas, and great features can go hand in hand with user privacy. And they must. Realizing technology's potential depends on it. That's how Apple's CEO, Tim Cook, begins his essay on privacy, just right now published in Time magazine. A California judge has ruled that American cops can't force people to unlock a mobile phone with their face or finger. The ruling goes further to protect people's private lives from government searches than any before and is being hailed as a potentially landmark decision. That's how Thomas Brewster begins his coverage in an article just days ago in Forbes. The need for both regulation and rights, it's exactly the conversation I wanted to help kickstart in the right to remain private video I posted last weekend. In the age of ubiquitous data harvesting, it's one of the most important conversations for all of us here on this channel and out in the world. I didn't intend to follow that video up so closely with another, but I don't every time get what I want. Welcome back to the show. Thanks again for joining me. I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is Vector. The first thing I covered in the previous video was how companies had utterly failed to regulate themselves. Over the last few years, the last year especially, we've had one incident of data abuse after another, one data breach after another. We've had our personal private information bought and sold and leaked for politics and money and power and marketing. So the time has come to consider government regulation with fines and jail time considerable enough that it becomes in the company's best interests not to fail, not to avoid, not to abdicate, not to procrastinate, not to ship without privacy or to try to bolt it on later, but to build products with privacy from the start. Last year, Tim Cook addressed this in his keynote at the 40th International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners. This year, he's doing it in Time Magazine. Meaningful, comprehensive federal privacy legislation should not only aim to put consumers in control of their data, it should also shine a light on actors trafficking in your data, behind the scenes. Some state laws are looking to accomplish just that, but right now there is no federal standard protecting Americans from these practices. That's why we believe the Federal Trade Commission should establish a data broker clearinghouse, requiring all data brokers to register, enabling consumers to track the transactions that have bundled and sold their data from place to place, and giving users the power to delete their data on demand freely, easily, and online once and for all. There are a couple factors when it comes to paying with data that I think are critical to recapitulate here. First, everyone has different amounts of time and money, but we're all rich when it comes to data. Even though it's invaluable to the companies that spend billions of dollars to provide us with products designed to harvest it, we treat it as though it has no value to us. Second, we see clocks ticking away and money leaving our wallets and our accounts. We don't see our personal messages and photos being sucked up into the cloud or the big internet companies hiding behind our beds or following us from behind the bushes. So the cost doesn't even really register. Now, I'm not saying computers should have to animate our private photos going up and into the cloud or have a little ninja icon or something peeping at us as we travel around. But to Cook's point, one of the biggest challenges in protecting privacy is that many of the violations are invisible. We need to drop a can of paint on it one way or another. The second thing I covered in the previous video was how we also needed protection from the government, both when it comes to evolving existing rights like the one against self-incrimination and when it comes to extra legal activities like warrantless surveillance or demands for backdoor access to operating systems. That brings us to the ruling of Magistrate Judge Candace Westmore. The order came from the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California in the denial of a search warrant for an unspecified property in Oakland. The warrant was filed as part of an investigation into a Facebook extortion crime in which a victim was asked to pay up or have an embarrassing video of them publicly released. The cops had some suspects in mind and wanted to raid their property. In doing so, the feds also wanted to open up any phone on the premises via facial recognition, a fingerprint, or an iris. Previously, some courts had ruled that passcodes couldn't be compelled because they were commensurate with testimony, which is protected, but that biometrics were physical and so didn't enjoy the same protection. 
Why should a passcode, fingerprint, and facial scan be treated differently if they all accomplish the same thing? That's just what Westmore focused on in her ruling, declaring that technology is outpacing the law. The judge wrote that fingerprints and face scans were not the same as physical evidence when considered in a context where those body features would be used to unlock a phone. If a person cannot be compelled to provide a passcode because it is a testimonial communication, a person cannot be compelled to provide one's finger, thumb, iris, face, or other biometric feature to unlock that same device, the judge wrote. How much this weighs on future court rulings will have to wait and see, but it's a precedent in the right direction. And yeah, as always, I'm just as concerned with law enforcement having access to the evidence they need to solve the cases we need them to solve. In this specific case, the judge said other means were available, including getting the data from Facebook itself. But all of this is going to have to be carefully balanced so that what's in our minds, our memories, our thoughts remains sacrosanct, even as the digital world extends and eventually integrates with them. That's why I'm going to keep talking about this and why I so very much encourage you to do the same. And if you need a place and a platform to start, check out Wix. Wix makes it incredibly simple to create powerful, professional, maybe even highly political and personal websites without having to worry about any of the heavy lifting at all. You make it the way you want. Your imagination is the only limit and Wix gets it and keeps it online for you and your business. Whether it's your views on the right to privacy, the show notes for your new podcast or video channel, or bookings for your gigs or events, or showcases for your restaurant or startup or whatever, there's no limit, just your ideas just you. Go to wix.com slash go slash vector and get your website going today. Thanks Wix and thanks to all of you for supporting the show. If you zoom out into the future and you look back and you ask the question, what was Apple's greatest contribution to mankind? It will be about health. But I think privacy will be right up there because without privacy, Apple won't have the trust that they need to really change the healthcare world and so many worlds beyond it. At least that's what I think. Now, I really want to know what you think. Hit like, hit subscribe, hit up your friends and let them know about this video because it really helps the channel. And then hit up the comments and let me know. And thank you so much for watching.